Please welcome to the program Zanny Minton Beddoes. Please. I hope you're all right. I'm all right. I when think I was here I'm nine years right. ago, we almost killed Jimmy Carter with the rolling chairs. He almost went all the way back. No, it swivels this way. It does swivel. Uh, we have the economy. This is your magazine. We have it. We Woo. brought it with us. I don't know if you can see that there. We're we out right there. And it's, it's got a post-it note in there for... What? The right page that I you need no to look at? I have no idea why there's a post-it note in there. <laughs> I thought there was a centerfold. It wasn't there. I don't know what was happening. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the show, though. We very much appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, the economist wrote about some of Joe Biden's issues a year ago. Y you wrote, is he going to be up for the job in, in the second term? What were the concerns that, that you guys had then? So we wrote after the midterms that he should not stand for a second term. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, when he came in, it was he was hoping to be, he said pretty much that he wanted to be a one-term president. He was a grown-up. He would save the country from so Donald Trump. Said he was the bridge candidate. He was the bridge candidate. He didn't say which bridge. <laughs> uh, wasn't the Williamsburg was Bridge. It's it one of those a, bridges a in bridge Florida that go hope, 30 miles. It, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think we, after the midterms, we thought that it was time for him to kind of make that clear. He would have been, had he said he was going to be a one-term president, he would have been a remarkable one-term president. He's achieved an unbelievable amount for one term. But now we are where we are here, and huge majorities of the American people, including huge majorities of Democrats, think he is too old for a second term. It's really alarming that the only person between us and the return of Donald Trump is a frail 81-year-old. You said that like Voldemort. You said the return, <laughs> the return look, of I, Donald Trump. Yeah, no, I, it, 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 look, it really worries me. And, and it's, it may be a little weird, but for those of us outside the U.S., well, couldn't they say, though, if, if you say I had a remarkable first term, what's to say I won't have a remarkable second term? He's 81 years old. What? You know, <laughs> he's, he is the same age pretty much as my father. I love my father dearly. My sure. father's a wonderful man, but my father should be nowhere near the most important job in the world. He probably never should have been. But 81-year-olds, 81-year-olds... He doesn't you... watch this thing, does he? Does he watch? <laughs> How many... This may, be, this may be a little explanation we'll sure, have to go understood. on later. But he, uh, you know, an 81-year-old, you know what they're like at 81. You know what they're going to be like at 85. You know, time travels one way, and people go in one direction at that age. Why are you and looking at me like that when you say that? That, <laughs> that, that seemed awfully personal. As you said at the beginning of the show, you're a t good 20 years younger. You know, you've got a long time still. It's, it's is, pretty interesting. Is... But let me ask you, so there is obviously a press pool. There's a White House press corps. There's a certain amount of mystery that seems to surround this. All the people behind the scenes are saying, you don't know like we know. He's leading these meetings. He's unbelievable. You, I wish you could see it. But certainly, there are press people that travel with it the president. Surely, I have not seen people come out with first-hand accounts. They have not come what, out and said... bounding along Air Force One. Right, or just said, I follow the president, I'm with him every day, he is unbelievably sharp, he's just camera shy, or whatever it is, <laughs> but nobody is making those. It makes it seem conspiratorial. Uh, yeah, and I think it's what is clear is that it is quite hard to get access to this president. He is very carefully shepherded around. He doesn't do very many press conferences, he doesn't do very many interviews. I assume that's for a reason. And I hear the same thing. You know, he's very sharp. He talks for a long time. He can outlast anybody in a meeting. I'm perfectly prepared to believe that on some subjects that's true. Joe Biden knows a huge amount about foreign policy. He is exactly the right person to have in the Oval Office, in the world as it is we have today. And I'm sure on certain things, he can go for hours and hours and hours. He can probably be in negotiations for a long time. But does that mean he should be president for another two terms? I, I think it's worrying. Now, when you not say one he gets... Term, not another well, one term, yeah. <laughs> the world order is changing. And there is a part, you know, the economist is certainly, you know, it, it does represent a certain mainstream point of view or, or establishment. Well, actually, interestingly, we, we stand for good classic English liberalism. It's not the same as an American liberal, which is more of a lefty, but the English liberalism... Am I going to get tested on this? Because no, I don't... No, 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 I'm going to start with a little, little lesson here. But no, we, we believe in individual freedom, free markets, limited government. We've kind of believed in that for a long time. And for a long time, you're right, our view was the kind of mainstream view. 
you know, Reaganism, Thatcherism, even Clintonism, you know, it wasn't too far apart. That was the mainstream right. view. But now it, it, we're absolutely not the mainstream view. Now, you know... I should have said establishment. I think it's yeah, more the, establishment. the status quo. Well, we're absolutely not the establishment view. And now industrial policy is in, big state is in, protectionism is in, all manner of things that we traditionally didn't believe in. And so our kind of liberalism... I think is is very much not the mainstream view now, and we're championing liberalism in the face, actually, of pretty concerted uh, resistance to it and people going in different directions. So the whole kind of Trumpist assault, if you will, this, there's an, in fact, our cover, this week's cover is going to be about this, almost certainly, unless something dramatic happens, which is about national conservatism. It, this idea which, you know, the MAGA Republicans have, but also a bunch of conservatives in Europe you know, Victor Orban, Georgia Maloney in, in Italy, Marine Le Pen in France. Mm -hmm. they are, there are differences between them, but they're united by an idea that they want to be anti-globalist, mm -hmm. they're anti-trade, they're very skeptical of migration, they want to push back against what they see as progressive, woke ideology. Would you say this is perhaps a new world order that they well, are they promoting? They would love that. Oh, no, they're the they ones who always talk about how there's a conspiracy to create a new world order, when if you really look at it, they're the ones trying to create it. They're shifting. There was an old paradigm, right, which was America post-war aligned itself with liberal Europe against communism. That was the stability of the world since World War II was capitalism versus communism. It looks like there appears to be a realignment along the lines of not capitalism and communism, but woke and unwoke. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it is what ties Putin to Trump and Orban to Trump. If you listen to Putin when he talks about uh, uh, orthodox Christianity and Western society and anti-gay rhetoric, he sounds like a AM no, radio host. Absolutely. And there, and there, <laughs> there are people in, in the Republican Party now who, are, who warm more to Putin than to Ukraine, for example. So I, I think you're right. Well, I think all of them. I, no, not all of them. Not all of well, them. Well, Mitch no. McConnell, but he just stops working every now and again. <laughs> serious point there's a complete you know one way of thinking about it is a is a MAGA takeover of the Republican Party but another I think there's something more profound going on which is there is potentially a kind of revolution in conservatism which may end up being as big as the kind of Thatcherite Reaganite revolution mm -hmm. which is taking it in a completely different direction no, which it's, is it's not a populism the absolutely. and a nativism but it's combined with this anti-wokeism that almost seems to be the more powerful unifying theory than it is, it used to be economic theories, and now it's theories of social culture yes. issues. identity, social culture. That's right. Absolutely. No, I think there is, that's definitely a fault line, and the, the people you cite are definitely on one side of it. Whether it's a new world order yet, I don't know. Uh, we did not talk about NATO. Uh, Donald Trump very famously came out and said, I would encourage Russia, this was years ago, uh, to attack them so that they would pay their bills, as though uh, the value of NATO is in what they can contribute financially. What, what is your he, thought on he that? Sounded like, he sounded like the mobster, right? They gotta pay, they gotta pay. That's right. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't, I think, understand what collective security is about. Like, the NATO, NATO is, basically, if you attack the smallest NATO country, you're attacking America. That, that basic deal was understood by the Soviet Union and then by Russia, that's why we haven't had an attack on NATO. I think that is undermined by him basically saying it's a protectionist racket, which is what he... So I don't think Donald Trump cares about alliances, but the reason it's so dis disconcerting and worrying, if you're in Europe right now, is this is happening at a time when Vladimir Putin has already done a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. He is rearming much faster than Europe. Europe is a fundamentally more dangerous place. So even with Donald Trump nowhere near the White House yet, him saying it right now is, is destabilizing. It makes it much more likely that... Putin, an aggressive dictator, you know, it pushes further. And at the same time, you have this aid for Ukraine held up here in this country. And to be clear, aiding Ukraine, giving the money to Ukraine, is the cheapest possible way for the U.S. to enhance its security. It's just, it's absolutely... The fighting is being done by the Ukrainians. They're the people who are being killed. The U.S. And, and Europe are supplying them weapons. And in doing so, we are pushing back against Putin. I mean, it... I've been to Kiev twice right. and, and lived there 30 years ago, and you can't go there and not think this is a European country that is looking westward. And for the U.S. to abandon it now, if it does, it's almost jaw-dropping. The unfortunate part for Ukraine, 
seems to be that it also holds a place in our culture war. Yeah. I don't think there's any principled opposition from the right in terms of sending arms. There might be in terms of the amount or the money or some of those things. I think they're really caught in the idea that Putin and Orban and that illiberal order are their natural allies. And so Ukraine, they have to paint that as uh, Nazified or uh, utterly corrupt, as though Russia is somehow fundamentally, uh, you know, just this unbelievable Valhalla. But uh, I think that's where, I think that's why Ukraine, if, if I think Russia had done there somewhere else, Ukraine happens to hold a very strange place in this whole Burisma, yeah, Hunter exactly. Biden, illiberal, like... Exactly. Donald Trump doesn't like Volodymyr Zelensky because of the whole issue around the first impeachment and Burisma right. and all of that stuff. That's so, right. And it was he a holds, perfect he call. holds grudges and That's he doesn't right. like Zelensky and he likes Putin because Putin's tough. That's right. That kind of thing. Then I think there are a bunch of Republicans who are genuine, what you might call old-fashioned isolationists who just mm -hmm. don't think the kind of U.S. should be involved in this That's stuff. Right. Then there's a bunch who, who have perfectly reasonable concerns about whether the money's being well spent, corruption in Ukraine. There That's is plenty right. of corruption in Ukraine, yeah. whether it's all well spent. And then I think you're right. There are these, and let's call them the Tucker Carlson Republicans, who, who kind of have a sense that there is somehow the U... The, Putin is the, the hero and Ukraine is the villain, which is sort of hard to get your head around, but that does seem to be what they think. Right, and that's, I do think that's the world order that, that they would be pushing towards. But this gets back to journalism. In this country, it's all about the money, and there's very little talk about, even after September 11th, when Article 5 was invoked and they came to our defense. Yeah, the like, only it's time this, Article 5 has been invoked right, is, was, was for to us. come to the defense of the United States. And yet, States. It's, it really does boil down to, oh, is this just a financial transaction gone awry, or is this uh, the valuable alliance that's kind of held together the world order? And which, by the way, though, we have to be able to criticize what it did in Iraq and all these other things. But if we can't talk honestly about it, we end up shutting down all the conversation. Of course. I think there is discussion about it. I mean, NATO... Most of the time, for most Americans, is not something that's probably top of mind. But I think there is a kind of reason. I have reasonable... not been to a party where it's not the first thing people talk about. When you you clearly about. move in serious circles. I wow. do. It, generally, it's you go in, it's a little NATO talk, and then a keg stand. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for being here. It's Thank really you. Fantastic. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny